Adam Weishaupt encapsulated a game plan to bring about this world government. And in this game plan, he had it uh, mentioned in there that they were to take France in the year 1789. Now, these plans were formulated into writing and translated by one of the Ingolstadt University professors, one of Professor Weishaupt's cohorts, a guy by the name of uh, Xavier von Zweck. Now, Zweck uh, translated these into French so that they could be taken to Paris and Silesia. Now, there was a courier, a guy by the name of Lanz, who had been a, an evangelist minister, but quit God and decided to become an Illuminati uh, agent and a courier, and he was taking these materials by horseback through Bavaria. Uh, in a place called Regensburg, he was struck by lightning and it killed both him and his horse. And people found this man, this dead man and his horse with documents in the pouch and these documents were passed up the chain of command to the elector of Bavaria who got to wondering, is there really a gaining plan out here to conquer the whole world? So he staged, staged simultaneous raids on Rothschild's uh, associates, uh, primarily on Weishaupt's associates, and found a great deal of corroborating evidence, enough to convince him that there truly was a game plan out there to take the whole world. And there were six points to their game plan. They wanted the abolition of all religion, the abolition of property rights, of inheritance. And the worst one was down at the bottom of the list, the abrogation of the family. Now, we can see how that was implemented in Red China. Men went to one dormitory, women went to another dormitory, boys were here and girls were here, and the family was totally destroyed, and they used that to brainwash those people. When you got kids with no control over them except the one facilitator or his associates, the children are at their mercy. And it's planned for here, for us, for our children, for our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. They intend to show no mercy. Now this formulation of the Illuminati led them down the road to this, this game plan wherein they are working diligently to take over the whole world. And in the course of doing so, when this courier was found, the elector of Bavaria, one Theodor von Dahlberg, decided after he staged those simultaneous raids that he was going to contact every head of church and state in all of Europe and gave them a translation of the documentation that was found in the pouches of that dead courier, that apostate minister named Lanz. And so it was after the Napoleonic War when Napoleon ran into Lord Wellington at Waterloo and was stomped. Now, this would have been a big setback for Mr. Rothschild, but Mr. Rothschild had one of his associates following the war along. And this associate sent a message back to him by carrier pigeon. And the carrier pigeons let him know that Wellington had won. So what he did was he, he was in uh, Paris at the time, and he jumped in a boat, and he had some men take him through some terribly dangerous seas. Too bad he didn't get it right then and there, but nevertheless, he made it to the other shore, to Great Britain, and he sold all of his British uh, financial securities. And then he started acting all oh, so scared, like, and let the rumor out that Napoleon had won. 
Well, if no well, if Napoleon had won, everybody realized that their government was not going to be able to honor its financial obligations, and so they started selling theirs. And at the very depth of that despair, he quietly and surreptitiously had some of his friends start buying up those worthless securities. And so almost overnight, he increased his wealth by 21-fold. Now, it was time to disappear for a little while. He wasn't really popular because he had put out a false rumor that Napoleon had won. And when people found out that Napoleon hadn't won and they'd sold their government securities based on a lie, they were a little bit disappointed. But Baron Rothschild was in a position now where he could force a reformation of the Bank of England and cause his people to be put in positions of power and authority. And so, as a consequence, what it turned out well for him. It turned out way too well for him. So it was after this Napoleonic Wars that they had this big, big meeting in Vienna. The Rothschilds had his dignitaries assemble others from around the world and they said it is the scourge of war that plagues us and if we're ever to get rid of this scourge of war we're going to have to have some kind of Congress where nations can come together and we can live through this modern age. One of the attendees was the Tsar of Russia. And he remembered the documentation that he had gotten from the Elector of Bavaria, and he had studied it. And he knew about this program by the Illuminati to take over the whole world. And he got up in the middle of that meeting and he denounced the whole process. He pointed out that it was Weishaupt's plan to overthrow all governments and religion and take over the world in behalf of his organization. And he was the man personally who shot down the Congress in Vienna and Rothschild hated him for it. And he swore that he or his heirs one day would destroy the entire Romanov family. And we saw that happen. Well, it was before our times. We didn't personally get to see it happen, but we sure have a recording of it in our history books. That in November, of November 8th of 1917, I believe it was, that they went in and took over, killed the entire Romanov family, the Tsar and all his children. There's some speculation that one daughter, Anastasia, got away. And another son is uh, alleged to have gone off over to Poland and become a military officer under an assumed name. There's lots we don't know about what went on. Lots we probably never will know about what went on. Because everything has been based on deceit and lies. And we find ourselves boxed into corners based on these untruths. So it was shortly afterwards that they had another man from their group, a guy by the name of Abraham Lincoln, whose real name was Springstein. And Abraham Lincoln Springstein uh, went about fomenting the Civil War here. I'd like to call it the War of Northern Aggression because we've been lied to about that so much. We were told that was a, a war over slavery, but it wasn't. It was a war over states' rights. Two of the southern states, Virginia and North Carolina, had long ago outlawed slavery. And yet, 
It was used to rally northern forces. You know, that's the kind of thing I'd, I'd be willing to take part in. I would like to stop slavery wherever it could be found. And I'm sure it appealed to a lot of people to put an end to that despicable act of holding another human being like you would an animal and making them work for whatever you feel like giving them. Now, Abraham Lincoln had right in his cabinet a guy by the name of August Belmont. And August Belmont wasn't his real name. His real name was Schoenberg. He was a Rothschild agent. And down in the other camp, they had a Rothschild relative, a guy by the name of Judah Benjamin, who was the head of the secret police down there. And after that, Abraham Lincoln resented his involvement with these people. And he made a speech in which he said, I feel at this time more fear for my nation than any other time, even during the war. An era of corporations has been enthroned and corruption will grow in high places. And we will end up with the wealth of many aggregated in the hands of the few. Now his resentment resulted in action and he decided he was going to issue greenbacks. He'd, he'd had enough of working with these people and they would not put up with that. So they sent in one of their own, a guy by the name of John Wilkes Booth, a bad actor, who dispatched Abraham Lincoln so that, and it was done in conjunction with the uh, Jesuits. See, there are so many of these Illuminati organizations out there. The one we just described by Adam Weishaupt was called the Bavarian Illuminati. There was another Illuminati called Avion, over in, I believe, in Great Britain. There was one in um, uh, Switzerland. And there was another one in France, uh, the Grand Lodge Orient de la France. And there's a very important one called the Alumbrados that was formulated in Spain. Now the Alumbrados is Spanish for enlightened ones. And the Alumbrados only existed for about 20 years before they changed their name. They changed their name to the Society of Jesus. They called themselves the Jesuits and they pledged themselves as the protectorate of the Pope. And when you got the Illuminati protecting you, it's the kiss of death. Well, we find about the time that this civil war was over, there was a guy who had been born in Boston, Massachusetts in December 30th, 1809, a guy by the name of Albert Pike. He was an impressive intellect. He was a Harvard graduate back when it really meant something. He was the master of 16 languages and he was a despicable son of a... <clears throat> because he openly uh, worshipped Satan. He was part of an organization called the Palatalists. He was the one that converted this Knights of the Golden Dawn to the Ku Klux Klan. And he was the author of a book called Morals and Dogma. It is the most revered text among the Masons. And in this text on page 321, Albert Pike, said, it is Lucifer, the morning light, whose seething energies you must learn to control or implement. So it was this Albert Pike, the same guy that wrote a letter to his superior in the Illuminati, a guy over in Europe by the name of Giuseppe Mazzini, who was the revolutionary leader. And Giuseppe Mazzini also happened to be the founder of the Mafia. This letter that he wrote to Giuseppe Mazzini on August 15 of 1871 outlined three world wars. And the first of those world wars was 
to be fomented between the differences between the German nationals and the Brits and end up 